So good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to tell you that this will be the first call in Spanish. We will start in a couple of minutes, but now we will listen to Gusantega, who is our Secretary General. Thank you so much, Luana, um, and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here uh, for this call, especially so this call is really special for MCLD because this is the first time we've done a lot of regional meetings in French and Spanish. This is the first time we are actually doing a global call in Spanish with interpretation in English and French. So please make sure you click on the globe button and choose French or English or Spanish, whatever your language of preference is. Um, and it's, it's actually very fitting that this call is in Spanish today because today's call is about inclusive leadership. And as many of you may know, inclusion is a foundational value for MCLD. And so to have a call in, in, you know, in Spanish, a global call in Spanish with interpretation in French, English, and American Sign Language is really important for us uh, in our journey towards inclusion uh, because we believe that inclusion requires a lot of intentionality. Um, it's not a destination, as I've often read in a disability rights magazine that I quote. It's a journey. And so there's a lot of intentionality that needs to go into it to ensure that we are always trying to be more inclusive than we are currently. So I hope that this trend will continue. Um, and I really want to thank my colleagues, uh, Luana, who is the regional coordinator for Latin America and Caribbean, and Sylvia, who is with Girls Not Brides and has been a long time champion of CLD and a friend of the movement for putting this call together for us. Um, I also want to thank our interpreters here today for ensuring that we can be inclusive in the spirit of MCLD and today's call. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup today. Uh, we're talking about inclusive leadership. Um, we're going to dedicate most of the call towards that. And at the end, we will do a quick round of updates because as many of you know, MCLD is in the process of transformation. We have had a lot going on this year from the setup of our global assembly, which in a sense completes our structure, our new structure, uh, all the way to the strategic planning process that many of you have been a part of. Um, so we will have updates towards the end of the call. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to Luana and Sylvia for today's call. Thank you. I will try. I will now make a brief summary because we do not have the translation. We didn't have translation into French. So basically, uh, we're really happy to have a global call in Charlene Spanish. This has a lot to do with our values, with our efforts for inclusion and diversity. And those are two key values for our movement. Also, that's, this is an experiment because that's the first time that we are trying out the new languages. So thank you. Thank you for your patience. And please be patient. Once again, I will remind you, that we have three languages for today's meeting. The main language will be Spanish for today. Then I will tell you in French and in English how you can find interpretation.
Yes, I think we are ready to go. Sarah, the following slide, please. So, this is today's lineup. First of all, Sylvia and I will share some key concepts and also we will share and talk about the movement for you because our global call is at wide space. So we want to raise more awareness about our movement, but also we have three important present uh, speakers that will be with us, the three important leaders, Dan Alvarado, Las Nia Lideres from Guatemala, Luisa Castro, Garza, Mexico, and Guadalupe Vargela, Patria Diversa, Argentina. So we'll have interactive spaces, and then we will have small group rooms. And over there, we will think about how we can transform today's leadership so that it can become more inclusive and more diverse. And then we'll come back to the plenary to exchange ideas and to bid farewell. So let's move on to the following slides. Well, talking about our movement, I would like to tell you that our movement is called the Movement for Community-Led Development. It was called in Malawi. It was organized in Malawi in 2015. And we are a network led by the majority world with more than 2,000 um, community-based organizations. And we also have 17 national associations, which are the very core of our movement. And we also have 35 international NGOs, which work together uh, voting rights for all the people. The thing that we have in common is our commitment for community-led development, because we think that this is key. It goes beyond conventional development, and we adopt a transformational model for quality, so that communities are the ones that are at the helm of development. Now let's move to the following slide. So our objective is community-led development wherever it is necessary. And so we work on five main main objectives. So voice and agency for women, youth, and PVD, PWD, and marginalized group. And here we are linked to inclusive leadership because not all community-led leaderships and community organizations work with old members of the community. Moreover, in Latin America, so we can also talk about that, we have community movements which are not inclusive. They do not include all the voices in society. So we think that this is key. And in order to create, starting from the community, we have to integrate all people. So for this, it's key, this topic for our movement. Now, second topic is adequate community financing. Because communities need finance to be game changers, but also we have to have good governance from a local, local level, strong governance, good quality services, and all this requires also resilience in communities. Now let's move on to the second slide. Over here, we can see the last points. I was mentioning resilience, quality public services, and so on. Now let's move on to our change theory, which we would like to briefly outline with you now. There are two main points on which we work. First of all, alliances to carry out some activities. We think that now, going back to what we were saying, we need healthy, resilient, productive, and independent communities. And they have to be the leaders of the process, and they need to create alliances to do so. Part of those alliances has to do with incidents. So we have to work together with local governments nationally 
to decentralize and distribute power. And I, we think that there is a convergence over here and there is a significant change that allows us to reach SDGs. And over here, we are national associations within our movement, as you can see here in the graph. Now let's move on to the following slide. So that's our change theory. And so what do we do? We work with public advocacy so that the organizations can talk di directly to with financing entities. And we also practically create together because if you want to change the paradigm, we also have to create new ways of working and no one has the secret, you know? We have to work together to create another model, an alternative one for local and community development to become pillars. And the pillar over here is solidarity. So um, collaboration in investigation, but also solidarity between movements. And I think, we think that this is important, as I was saying in this second point, we need thriving national associations, successful ones. Now, the following slides. So, what we will talk about today is diversity in leadership and inclusivity in leadership. So, the first thing we wanted to ask ourselves was, why are these conversations relevant? Well, first of all, it's key to establish common language because it's really important to start by realizing that among the members of society in humanity, there are a lot of differences talking about our experience, access to resources, the way we're treated and the possibilities of develop ourselves and improve. Next slide. So we do realize that those differences have to do with structural inequalities which are systematic and systemic and they will not be solved on their own. So the first step here is to recognize this difference. And here we have to talk about SDGs that say that we have to create develop models that leave no one behind that include everybody. Following slide now. And to do so, we have to focus on a really important concept that uh, was suggested by Quadra, who is one of our speakers that will come soon. So intersectionality. Intersectionality is an analytical tool to understand the ways in which different social characteristics connect to one another, generating different, different experiences of oppression and privilege. So here we have a graph, a chart that we'd like to describe because it's really, it was really difficult to translate it all, but basically this intersection of all the lines in this graph has to do with, uh, for example, the fact that we talk about women as a, as a huge group, but not all the women face the same situation. There are differences and it depends on, for example, their religion, but also their age, or also where they live, their skills, their social class, sexual orientation, ethnicity, eth ethnicity, eth gender identity, or the languages they speak. It's not that all of us are the same. Uh, face the same situation. We can be in the same group, but have different situations in our lives. And this is really important to understand. If not, when we create groups, we may call these oppression <coughs> experiences invisible. Some groups are more oppressed than others, clearly. Next slide. 
so here you can see some images and uh, on the left i would like to show a solution so for example we see a person who is out of a group a woman who is looking at the glass ceiling she sees that men become leaders and she is relegated to another role and then we can see how we can create inclusive spaces because spaces do not have to be created in a way and then we have to make an effort to include one person so we adapt it no the same design of the work place, the design, the creation of all the spaces, well, this should start with the idea or in the question, how can we create space for everybody? So this graph now represents a lot of cases in which there are people with disabilities on a wheelchair, for example. There are blind people, people from different ethnicities with different sexual orientations or um, religions and beliefs and this is the world we want to live in a world that has space for everybody and there should be no effort in including people from the get-go we should start working with everybody it's no privilege or no favor that we do to people next slide So here we can see two key concepts and we are getting to the end of the presentation. Basically here you can see the idea of inclusion. Because inclusion is key point. If we want to have different spaces and diverse spaces, these definitions were created by organizations in um, Stivicus, for example, in working for inclusions, that's another network. So no one invented this. It's a collective definition. But basically, diversity is all those differences, personal, religious, social differences that people have. There are some ways in which we differentiate ourselves from the people. And diversity embraces and celebrates difference drawing from intersectional perspectives and differences are celebrated as strengths and opportunities. Inclusion has to do with an active part because it implies acting actively so that everybody can be part of the change so that more people can participate in our daily life. So inclusion is an obligation. We should think it in, from practical terms. So that's a dynamic and ongoing process on various levels. So if we want to be inclusive, and if we work for inclusion, we will have a diverse world. So basically here you can see the same slide, but both in English and in French. Now let's please move on. So over here you can see in the first part, exclusion. So we see one society in which there are people who are basically marginalized. That's exclusion. What's integration in instead? It was the paradigm for a lot of years. So we should create a space for all these people who have no place for themselves. And then we create a space only for them. So they, they stay only with ourselves, with themselves. We try and integrate, but we are the ones entitled to the power and they integrate them. Well, inclusion is the result of creating spaces that embrace all types of diversity. They have to be designed for all people, there should be no effort made so that everybody has their own space. Finally, a really important difference, difference between quality and um, equity. So first one it gives everything the same way to the same people, to all the people without considering that we do not start from the same point. So these models cannot work. Equity is ensuring that everybody has what they need to develop themselves. 
get the same level as the other people to have opportunities. So equity is for all of us, giving all of us what we need, not all the same thing, uh, not everybody the same thing. So this is really important. Now, next one, I will uh, leave the floor to Sylvia. Sorry, I just forgot one more slide. So we wanted first to work because we've been speaking for quite a lot. So Sylvia, I will now leave the floor to you. We will invite you to participate and I will look for the links. So thank you so much, Luana. Thank you so much to all the people here together with us. So as Luana was saying earlier, it was really important for us to have this uh, brief moment at the very beginning to have an idea of the call, how it, why it's so important to talk about leadership and how this is connected to uh, community-led de led development. So now we will ask you to go on with this conversation. We will ask you to get into Mentimeter. You see over there in the cloud on the right, you see the link. Uh, so get, please get in and use this code 65914628 so that you can reply with three words to these questions. What are the main reasons that exclude people from leadership spaces in your country, context, or region? So you would like to see what's happening right now, what you are seeing from this space you're in, your context, your region. So we would like you to add some words. And if you have any problem to get into Mentimeter, tell us, we will try and add your words. So if you have any problem, just write your words in the chat, in English, in Spanish, or in French, that's not a problem. We will be in charge of adding those to the cloud if it, Mentimeter doesn't work with you. Uh, for you, quickly, so here we can already see the first words. Luana, I think the um you put the link to just the main yeah, website in Mentimeter, put... not to the specific question. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Oh no, where do we find the code? So for all of you, the link that I put in the chat will take you to the Mentimeter page. And over there it says, please add your code here. And with the code that I've just shared, you can get in and uh, participate in the word cloud. You can see my screen, right? So over here, if you can read them, that will be great. Thank you. So perfect. So we are seeing some of the words that are now appearing and they have to do with languages, with power, with age, with bureaucracy, with distance. So these are some of the main causes of exclusion that we are seeing. So poverty, for example, some of the words that we are seeing and even the size of these words are indicating how many times people are adding that word. But please remember that you can write it in English, in French, or in Spanish. That's the same. So we are seeing contact classes, ethnic groups, religion, money. So we will keep this open. And now we will go back to the word cloud later to see what you are going to add. So thank you all. Thank you to all the people who have added some of the words that are now linked to this topic. And now let's leave the floor to our guests today, three women leaders from Latin America. They will talk about their experience. So let's now start with Tana Alvarado. Daniel Varado, I will tell you who she is. 
So she's a student who works on um, safeguarding rights. She's 24 years old. She wants to focus. She's now studying at university on rights and she specialized on gender issues and um, youth. And she's key in promoting sexual and reproductive rights, but also in fighting violence towards um, girls, adolescents, and women in Guatemala. So the floor is yours so that you can talk about some important issues. You will have eight minutes to share with us some information on how this path, this experience has been for you. Then we'll move on to the following guest. When you will only have two minutes left. I will tell you so that you can wrap up. So, Donna, the floor is yours. Please remember that there is interpretation. So, please speak slowly so that it can be interpreted into both English and French. So, please, the floor is yours. So, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for introducing me. I'm Dana Alvarado. I'm 24 years old, as, is, as they said earlier. So I'm part of the coordination of a project called Las Niñas de Lideras, Girls Lead. So in Guatemala, we work in Chimaltenango. And our work focuses on being able to support girls and adolescents so that they can develop themselves in their communities, but also in the whole society. Because sooner or later, they will have to grow in society and participate in it. So we work with girls between 7 and 17 years old, and we work on a transitional model. And we will talk about that a bit more later. And every single time they become major of age, they have the possibility of covering another role in the organization. And also this group has another group that is called Petit. So basically, this is the key group of all our work. But in this group, we have girls and adolescents. So basically, this group organizes everything, creates key ideas for our project, and also they are part of the decision process here. Yeah. So I think that's a great experience. And with that, they will, we are able to share with them all the work that we are doing in Guatemala. So first of all, I would like to say that for us as Las Nia Lideren, it's really important to realize that they are going through a space and in the reality, which is different from us. I'm not old and young as well, but anyway, I realized that it's not the same. I'm not living what I was living when I was in my childhood. So my reality is different. The context is different as well. So that's why we need girls to be at the very code. We need core. We need some space for them to be leaders organize, in organizations, for example, but also they can be part of the decision-making process. So I think it's really important to realize that girls are going through different things. They have different problems for us. So even if they are not in an organization, they can realize that they have some potential to develop in those communities or those contexts and realities. So now my second point. It's really important for us to realize that girls have different skills or like other things or learn in a different way. So we should adapt ourselves to their spaces and contexts and cultures and also to the languages and their ways of relating to one another. And that's something that we have seen quite a lot because, for example, I I wasn't born and I, didn't, I wasn't even raised in the community I work in and I've learned a lot about how they relate to one another and, for example, the ways in which I was raised are, were very different from the ways they were raised 
And also it's really important to highlight that now the violence index is far higher than uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So we could say that girls are now constantly involved and part of a vulnerable system. And they think that that's another important issue to point out because with that, we can adapt all the solutions and actions so that uh, the girls can be safe, secure, and comfortable at the same time. Another thing that I wanted to share with you today is that it's really important to accompany them in all their stages of their life. And as I was saying, I do not know if all the organizations here work with adolescent girls, but around us, there are a lot of adolescent girls. And if we work at some moment with them it's really important to know that we should accompany them in every single stage of their growth and i really like to think that they evolve as well and their leadership changes and it's really important they can do a lot even if they are seven or ten years old still they can do far more when they move from the age of 12 and to 15 years old and when they are adolescents. So for me, it's really important to realize that we have to accompany a girl in all the stages of her growth and that will empower her leadership and give them security to move around, but also to have all the resources, not only financial ones, but also to have someone, someone they trust walking together with them. Another thing that I would like to focus on here is how we can do all that. How can we accompany them? Because sometimes we can just talk, but we don't walk the talk. So now I was like, so um, as I was telling you, first of all, we should realize that they have potential that girls can do things maybe even if they are not as old as me they can still plan they can still invent something and create something then we should think of all the needs that they have their specific needs not my idea of my perspective or their needs, because my perspective is different from theirs. So it's important to focus on their needs, interventions, on what makes them uncomfortable. Finally, we should accept that sooner or later, they will end up telling us what they like or what they want to do. And uh, sometimes we do not really focus on that. It's really easy, actually. But... Uh, if we do so, if we listen to them, we could have a lot of guidelines on how we can work, not only on our daily life, but also on the organization. And that will be key to listen, to always listen to the girls in the spaces we are part of, especially in the community spaces that we have opened as an organization. So that's so thank you so much for inviting me. I think I will not be able to be there in all the sessions, but still here in the chat, I will put our email so that we can you can contact us if you need more information. Thank you so much for giving us this space. Thank you so much. You saved 25 seconds, so seven minutes, 35. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dana, for sharing all the importance of uh, the girls' leadership, what's happening, how they are working, and thank you for your leadership. You're a young woman, and you are a leader as well, and uh, your viewpoint is really important. Your experience is key, so thank you so much. Thank you for such an interesting presentation, and for the people who are in the chat, we would like to leave here a question. So what's the context for the girls in your region, if you can say it in the chat and so on. So the idea is that everything we are doing can help us later share viewpoints and ideas in the group. So thank you, Dana. 
it will be a pleasure to interact more thanks to your um, speech. Thank you for your time now. Let's move on to Luisa Castro. Luisa Castro is a co-director and director of the operation program Girl Up Mexico. So that's a young led movement that inspires girls, connects them to be activists for gender equality. She started working on leadership when she founded the first Girl Up uh, group at uh, the Autonomous and University during her international relations studies at university. So as uh, director of the program and operation, she works to try and offer high impact programs to the community to strengthen the network of change. She's also part of a platform which promotes female leadership in politics for better justice, justice, environmental protection and wellness. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you here. So please tell us about Girl Up. Tell, you, tell us about your journey, Just leadership journey, being a woman, being young. So what are the challenges and the opportunities? The same idea, basically. So we will stop you when you, when it's, uh, you will, when it's six minutes that you are speaking. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to see you all. As I was saying earlier, we are a um, youth-led movement, but we were also created within the UN Foundation. That's really important, but it can also be really complex at the same time because it was created in the Global North. So actually to adapt that model to a country like Mexico and to a region like Latin America, which is so different and diverse uh, and different from what happens in the case in the US. Well, that was a challenge actually, but that it's something that we did not wing of all the problems because the idea is not merely to be a movement that offers tools. We also want to be what Dana was saying. So a movement accompanying people, accompanying girls and adolescents hand in hand to support them in their in developing their leadership skills. So many of the things that we have learned in this path, first of all, our commitment to fight it out against putting the adult at the core, at the center. So in Latin America, that's quite of an important idea. So if people, if they're adults, know more, that's the idea. Why? Well, we do not know. Well, probably because they have more experience, because they've spent more time in some movements, or because they've suggested their ideas for more time doesn't really mean that they have audiences. So that's our key effort. We want to fight against putting adults at the center because stemming from that, we see a lot of violence against uh, young people, against adolescents and girls. So that's key. And also we have worked on collective leadership and Global North has taught us that sometimes leadership is like there is a person speaking on stage in front of multiple people. That's the only type of leadership for them. But we realize that that's not actually it. And especially the region has shown us that for tradition and for multiple years, collective leadership is what really works. So it's over there that people learn how to find common ground to solve conflicts and to suggest solutions that can be beneficial for the whole community they're in. So we work on that as well. And uh, talking about this, something that I really like that Luana was mentioning is that even though there is collective leadership in the region, it's not always participative leadership. So it's not that all the people are able to participate. So we do an active and 
conscious effort so that all the people which are part of the community we are working in, well, so that all these people are certain on the fact that the space they are in is a safe one. And when they are certain of all this, they start trying to speak and say, well, I have this idea. I would like to suggest that I would like to be part of this. So what we always try to do is to create an open space so that all the people, all the adolescents and all the young people participate, sharing their needs, their ideas, their challenges, what they need to go from A to B and how we can help them to reach their goal that's key for our movement and also uh, colonialism. So how can, we, how can we deconstruct all these colonialist practices which are so in depth within us because that's basically how our region is. So how can we question this? And uh, I must say that this was imposed this was distorted from the community we work in so basically they were saying to us that's neocolonialism and so we said okay let's stop here let's ask ourselves question on all this so that's the benefit of listening of uh, seeing the participation of the whole community we want to st we don't want to be like okay we are over there in the organizational chart and so we know everything no not at all i think that their perspective is really enriching now moving on because i do know that i only have two minutes three minutes left so now what are the barriers that we have faced because we are young women and or um, women that have different sexual orientations. We have seen a lot of misogyny. So it's not direct. It's not that someone comes like and says like, you are a woman, so I don't really trust you. But for example, we do not access a lot of funds or a lot of budget because the idea, the implicit idea is that women, and especially one women, young women aren't really able to handle money or maybe it's better not to give them millions in their organization. So these are the ideas that we have faced. And also we are treated as kids sometimes when we talk about what we do, especially with the private sector. For example, they say, oh, you are so cute. That's so nice seeing you here. And when you talk and they say, oh, that's such a nice project you have. And we're like, that's not a school project. It's a project that is generating an impact and community on the society we work with. And you will benefit from that as well. So, so we shouldn't really treat the group like that without respecting them. Another thing that is really common is the idea that the work, the, uh, the society does is noble and it has to be free. Yeah, you have to do it because you love what you do and so on. And yeah, that's true. That's true because we are passionate of the things we work on. But still, that's work. At the end of the day, what people are doing is devoting their time to the project and that's work so they should be paid and in a dignified way in a decent way that's something we have learned during the process and to wrap up another thing that impacts people especially people who are older than us with which we later work is that they are really shocked when you talk about this and you say we need respect or remuneration for the work we are doing so they are really shocked because they say well there are young people so they will not ask this but would like to wrap up here i hope that i haven't jumped on and off too much from one topic to another one but that's all thank you so much luisa you have talked about really important Thanks. Um, for example, the challenges, what you are doing, and all the 
things that we should analyze when talking about leadership and inclusion. Thank you so much. And once again, thinking about this dynamic with the chat, we would like to ask you all, according to your experience, what are the main contributions of young women in leadership spaces? So Louisa, once again, thank you so much for everything you've been sharing. It's such a pleasure to have young women leaders who are sharing what's happening, but also showing what's lacking and the path that we should be taking. So thank you so much. And now let's move on to our third guest. Guadalupe Barjida, she's a student of um, law at uh, La Matanza University. She studied at the work faculty in the University of Entre Rio. She works uh, with workshop for uh, people with uh, visual disability and also she has been part of a disability agency. When she was 21 years old, she... Sorry, there is someone else speaking, so it's really hard to follow because there's someone who is speaking. Please, let's close the mic. She's also vice president of the municipality of Moreno, and she also works on disability for Comunidad Septima. She also worked on Orgullo Victima, and uh, she was the young people reference for the Argentinian group of CRS and Ambliopes. Her work in political spaces and organization for the rights of people with disabilities has helped her for a gender perspective. Guadalupe, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And the floor is yours so that you can share your perspective on your idea of leadership. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Okay, great, thank you. There is a problem, someone is opening their mic and I can see two, I can hear two voices at the same time. Really sorry, we are solving a logistic problem. So it's Guadalupe reading rules, um, reading um, software. So we are solving this in the meantime. Please go on asking, answering in the chat. Okay, can you hear me now? No, the problem is that we keep on hearing the reader. Maybe lowering the volume. We cannot hear you anymore. You are mute. Okay, you can hear us now, right? You can hear me now. Okay, sorry, technical problems. Really sorry for that. Sorry for the interruption. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Luana, for inviting me to talk about these really important issues. Especially if we consider the collective and joint construction. So basically, what my friends have talked about before is the same thing I'll talk about now. So 
impervious, being treated as kids, being invisible in society. And what I would like to share here in my speech is the political participation of people with disabilities and how these barriers really affect this lack of opportunities or lack of accessibility, how they affect our daily life. And to talking about this, I would like also to talk about history in a country like Argentina. Where it was really hard to get to the rights that we have now. And I would like to mention disability. So we have problems with rights because they put us had the same conditions with of people who have no disability whatsoever. People who are considered normal, let's say, in society. Sorry, there is a, still a lot of interference. I'll try and be brief. But in the Frente Terrorista, that was a terrorist group uh, in the 70s, they developed their work saying that people with disabilities had to fight for their rights. Sorry, there is still a lot of interference from the reader, so I, I'm missing out half the words she's saying. Then civil society took in charge a part of society that the state wasn't really taking care of. And the state was maybe opening the market but, uh, caused problems to society. So the rights of people with disability were reduced to a really low percentage and they had to forcibly work on that both in society and also the organizations. In 2006, we have an international convention for people with disabilities from the UN, by the UN. In 2014, it becomes constitutional in Argentina. But in 2008, Argentina becomes part of the convention. So it says that this is human rights. It says that the human rights of people with disability aren't merely important with, for our country. They are key. And we see that in a lot of instances, we are made invisible by the government and the interaction from between state and the civil society becomes really hard. But here, I would like to highlight my experience in the organization Orgullo Disco that was created in 2019. And the idea was that disability in a poli is a political entity. Sorry, there is still interference from the reader. So disability is a political identity. So if society educates us towards shame, as Carlo Hobby, a homosexual, homosexual activist was saying in the 90s, but also other activists were saying, in the LGBT community. So pride was a political response and also disability should be something we should be proud of because we had this possibility and people with disability were always relegated because we were just a minority, a problem for health or also or interference from the reader. So I would like to say that this uh, focuses on multiple situations and multiple issues in which we realize there is vulnerability in terms of access, especially in rallies. In Argentina, the movements for uh, people's fights and carry out protests or rallies and people with disabilities 
realize that those rallies were really hard for us, for people with disabilities. So for example, we went to the Pride March in 2019, but we realized that people with disability had a lot of problems in participating. They had problems in having an accessible bathroom or toilet. So we were really affected. There were, were a lot of barriers that were detected. So what we've managed to do is to change the rallies in Argentina. The idea of rallies themselves, not only the idea of people that are heterosexual, white, and blonde, but also space in which all people, regardless of the diversity of or of the body, can participate in these protests. Right now, sorry, problems with reader. We are now creating Patria Diversa, another organization, and we know that we have more challenges than before because, for example, many people from the state were fired. And I think that it's happening basically all bodies in Argentina. So we have seen the right um, wing, the right wing groups have become in increasingly important. They have been breaching and violating all the guarantees. We have seen a lot of uh, hate speech, both LGBTQ and people with disability, people with diversity. And I think we think that unluckily, we are repeating the same patterns in the whole region. I'm worried, it's really worrying that the situation is worsening. So as a militant, as a person, I realized that disability is a political identity. And if society educates us towards shame, we should go on with pride. Here I'll wrap up the experience, the opportunity I've had to participate is first of all that people with disabilities and like the girls and women as uh, a my friend was saying before, well, we have to get in even if they don't want us a bit violently, so to say. So disability, um, Afro-American people, we have to keep on working to be considered and consider ourselves as a political group. We are people, we are fighters, we have disabilities, we are diverse and we are part of a different group, but we are a possibility, the possibility to create another paradigm, to create politics and participate. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sorry for the technical problems and it has been such a, pl a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Guadalupe, for your speech, for what you were saying about what's happening in the region and all the challenges that you have been facing. It's really important to talk about people with disabilities and how there are even more barriers and things we should talk about. So thank you so much once again for your participation and thank you to all the people who are here. And now we will go into smaller groups to talk about all these that we have seen in this first, first part of the meeting to have some common grounds, to listen to some experiences of what's happening in Latin America. But right now, we should also see what is happening and what will happen in other spaces. But before, please, let's share the screen once again, once again, because we wanted to ask you.
if you want to share some brief ideas. So if you want to say, how is it possible? How is exclusion in your region, country? Is there any exclusion in your region? And if there is, what are the main reasons that exclude people from leadership spaces in your country, context or region? And what are those excluded groups? So I don't know if you want to raise your hand to comment a bit more. You'll have one minute to give some answers to these three questions. So how do you know that exclusion is there? What are the main reasons that exclude people from leadership spaces? And what are these excluded groups? Just one minute per person, okay? Thank you. You can also put your answers in the chat, but if you want to open your microphone, we would love to listen to you. You can raise your hand if you want, or just open your mic. Okay, so right now, no one wants to share their viewpoint about uh, this question. So we will I ask want you. To, I want to share a little bit. Yes. Uh, in, uh, yes in, For in, the people who speak Spanish, go into the Spanish Okay, so are you hearing me? There are a lot of uh, uh, people, especially the disabled people, uh, blind, crippled, and uh, people that is uh, they are different. They are in most of the places they are segregated. And even is, is the worst scenario, people in uh, some, I, 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 I knew them, they, I know them, they are children who are born different. They were advised to just get, get rid of them, to throw them in the bush so that they will die because they are like devil or not human being. And even if you are taking care of them at home, then people will be laughing at, uh, at you in a very critical condition. But even to provide space, as I've already wrote, to provide space in a building where they can attend classes or even to create classes for them or to go to hospital where it is accessible, uh, even if you are providing space for them, people will ridicule at you. Why are you spending money? Like recently, we are building hospital and we provide a elevator who will cost like uh, 60 million uh, naira. People are saying, why? It is useless. When we provide RAM for accessibility to them, they said, why can't we build another building instead of providing all this for fiscally challenged people. So it's very, very unfortunate and uh, it, it breaks my heart. But thank you for the presentation and I'm really appreciative. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, So brief translation in Spanish so that Rocio can translate into French. So Rebecca was saying that still there are a lot of these marginalization situations and segregation for people with disabilities, even when we are creating a hospital, for example, the question is, why are you doing this for them? So there is still a long way to go. And she's deeply saddened to see all that's happening. Sylvia, we have little time, so maybe let's uh, go to the groups. Yeah, thank you so much, Luana, for summary. 
if for summarizing it all. So what we will do, next slide. We will go into the group. So we have talked about the problems, but we also want to focus on the solutions. So we will now get into a space for 15 minutes to be able to speak, considering all these questions. And before the questions, it's really important to focus on some rules of the game. How can you participate in these spaces? Well, first of all, you should be able to participate and listen to the experiences of the people in this small group. So we should be present and listen to what the people are sharing. And if you wanted to share something that has already been said, well, there is no need to repeat it. It's better to listen to something new. So following one, that's all, I think. Okay, here it is. Then another rules, there is no right or wrong in the answers. So please remember that we are thinking of solutions of issues that are happening in our various contexts. So please always bear this in mind, keep this in mind and then listen as if that was the first time with curiosity, we just will to learn something new. Even if we think that we know about the topic, even if we think that it, we have always talked about this, please listen with new ears. So now, without further delay, let's go into the groups and we will share the um, questions with all the groups so that we can you can think about these solutions. So we'll have groups in French, in English, and in Spanish so that we can uh, speak together with one another. Great, so you will now find a tab that will appear on your device and with that you will be able to join the group. See you again soon. So are you all listening in English? Great, then we can start. Yes, I am, I am. If all the groups could share a word. If all the groups could share a brief summary of all the ideas that were shared in the group, that would be great. Who wants to start? If you want, I can make a brief summary of what happened in the Spanish group. So we basically talked about the importance of um, raising awareness with dissemination campaigns, talking about our challenges, what's happening to people with disability, but also thinking of, uh, even though there are some uh, shares in some spaces for women, for young people with, for people with disability, that's just a patch. So we should start talking about these structural and cultural problems and we should give more voice and more strength to spaces, movements, and uh, organizations which are local so that they can become more visible. So that's one of the main proposals, visibilization with visibilization, making visible with campaigns. So that will be a brief summary. Then we will need three minutes and we have fine. So I don't know if we can share all the ideas from all the groups, just one more group maybe that wants to share their ideas. So we will now um, get all the ideas from all the groups and then we will share them, which maybe one group wants to talk about what they've talked about. Nelly? Sure, we can go. We also forgot to identify someone to report back, but some of the themes that came up in our calls were, or in our breakout, was one, how it's different in different places, and you have to know the context and um, the communities and the different identities and what they mean. Um, we also talked about um, the ways in which sort of um, 
the culture of in an organization, how it affects that and like, and what the leadership looks like um, and the management styles, how that can have a big impact also on how inclusive um, the whole environment is and what kinds of opportunities there are. Um, and we also talked about um, sort of the, the combination, Colleen said, of voice, practice, and confidence that you need to be sort of working at all of those levels. So having, um, you know, opportunities for people to actually be in leadership roles, as well as sharing why it's important and how it's successful um, and finding ways to build people's confidence and build capacities that they might have been left out of. I'll leave it there. Lucia, do you want me to translate or is it all okay? Okay, it's all okay. English. So there are multiple different situations in every region and we should see how we can work because there are a lot of skills that every person has and this enriches us. This is a really brief summary. Gunjan. Now we'll switch to English. So if you are Spanish speakers, listen to the Spanish translation. Bueno, get it. Thank you so much, Luana and Sylvia, and really all the speakers. This was a fabulous call. Um, I think again, it you know it's an important step towards inclusion for all of us in the movement, and I really hope that we can continue to build on it and integrate some of the learnings from this into our work, especially our national associations, uh, to see how we can be inclusive spaces, being mindful of the different challenges we face in different countries because of legal and other restrictions. Um. I wanted to quickly in the next couple of minutes share a few important updates because a lot has happened in the last month. And, uh, you know, even though we don't have, you'll see some of it in the newsletter, but just a couple of very quick updates. Um, many of you may have been part of uh, the Majority World Letter that was sent out last November to uh, funders and conveners around how to organize on locally led development. Uh, it was born out of the frustrations, particularly that we in the movement had encountered when many of our members tried to attend these events. We have a guidance document that has been created with majority world actors. It has been co-created and it's about 300 actors participated in it, which will be available in Spanish, French, English, Arabic and Swahili. Uh, just like the letter was, which is going to come out on the 12th of November. We encourage everybody to share it as widely as you can, especially with people who are organizing events. The second thing that I really wanted to share was that we had our second global assembly meeting yesterday. And as many of you would remember, in our structure, new structure, the global assembly is the body that has representatives from every recognized MCLD national association and takes decisions, makes policies, and looks at how do we ensure that MCLD's name and branding is safeguarded and we are all following the values and principles of MCLD. So the Global Assembly had a few important decisions and some work that happened yesterday, which I want to very quickly capture. But Luana, I think you need to. Do you need to summarize for the French translation? So this week, the Global Assembly met. They are following all the words, works, and they want to now summarize the most important issues. Right. 
Do you want to mention the guidance note, Luana? Also, this week, we will launch in English and Spanish, in, Sp in Arabic, in Swahili, and in French, a guideline that we created all together, collaborating with organizations from all across the world with recommendations for huge event organizers so that they can create more inclusive spaces. No worries. No worries. Absolutely. Okay. So what happened in the Global Assembly yesterday? Very quickly summarizing that. Uh, we've recognized over the last year, especially with all the travel and the opportunity to meet different national association members and representatives in person in Benin, Uganda, Malawi, and other places, that there is a lot of confusion around the new structure of MCLD and the roles and responsibilities of different parts of the structure. And so there is now a note, a structure document that lays this out, that lays out our values, that lays out the processes for the formation of a national association. I mean, that document has been there since February this year, but the structure document with the values and with functions of different parts of national of our structure is going to be translated and available by next week in Spanish, French, and English. The Global Assembly has also created three working groups. These working groups, the first of these working groups is actually going to ensure that all national associations are familiar with the structure and values and following the minimum standards for national associations. So that's a structure and process working group that's led by, um, I don't know if I can see Baranje is still on the call, but Baranje Tosu from Benin is coordinating that. The second working group that has been created is on strategic planning. And that's being coordinated by Sheikh Hugasimu from Sierra Leone. And that's going to provide oversight to the strategic planning process and ensure the ratification and socialization in April next year, when we expect to have our strategic plan ready. Um, that's one thing we are all co-creating. And the third is the orientations working group whose task is that in June, we are going to welcome the new cohort of Global Assembly members. And the task of the orientation working group will be to ensure that this new group is oriented and understands not just their role, but also the structure, the values, and where we are, the history, and where we are at MCLD. So that's a very, very quick readout. We'll share more details later. I know we are over time by a few minutes. But we just wanted to make sure that, you know, one of our commitments is to make sure that what's happening in the Global Assembly and in the governance is shared out with members. And so we wanted to share that and to say that keep an eye out for these very important documents that are going to be coming out next week. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, for staying longer than, you know, we had scheduled for participating and for helping us to really follow up on our intention towards being more inclusive. Big thank you to our speakers, to Sylvia and Luana for all the work they have done to ensure this is inclusive and to all our translators for helping us to make this inclusive and to Sarah, Nelly and the whole team that actually puts together these calls. And for all of you, thank you. Do we want to all unmute? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Before we unmute and say bye, translation for Fred. So now we will only have the same thing, but summarized in Spanish for the French translation translator, so I will not repeat the same thing.
Oh, the first group was structure and process. And that was to make sure that all national associations and members are aware of the values, the structure, roles of different parts of MCLD and are meeting the standards for national associations. So thank you all for being here. And I think that's a wrap. And thank you for staying here for some more minutes. We invite you all to open your mic if you want to say goodbye in your own language. Maxi, Maxi, Luana. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> How are you? Thank you. Bye-bye.